Hey, y'all, we wanted to invite you to partner with us in this ministry. Preacher's Hour needs your support. In order to make more and better content, we need you, yes, you listening to this right now, to become a patron. Choose the tier that best fits your preferences and help us make theology for our context. Thanks and enjoy this episode. All right, guys, welcome back to Preacher's Hour. It has been a while for us, and we'll explain why in a minute. Uh, I'm your host, Jeff Copeland, joined by my other co-host. What's going on, guys? How are you doing? It is John Drodos. I realized John, I let you that... You didn't even say your name, bro. How are you guys hey, doing? Guys. It's me. So if this is your first time, you're like, <laughs> can you tell us who you are? My bad. Oh, man. Yeah. So how you been, bro? How are you? It's been a while it's since we've sat behind these a mics. a very long time. It is July 21st. Yep. I got to call my boy. It's my boy Ryan McClarty's birthday. Shout out to you. Him. Now you got to listen to the episode. Yeah. Now because but um, yeah, man. So we haven't recorded since... Oh, man, it's been at least two months or so. Yeah, like... You guys don't know that necessarily. Right, but yeah, it's been a while since we recorded. John was on a mission trip for three weeks yep. in uh, South Africa, Cape Town, so yep. we're going to be talking, as you can see from the title and the description of this episode, that's what we're going to be talking about. Yep. Um, missions in general and John's story specifically. This is your second mission trip to South Africa. Yeah, correct. Yeah, I'm, I have yet to go on one. Yet is the key uh, word yeah, for right I'm now. Yeah, pl- I'm planning on it. We're hoping. We were supposed to go, and then uh, Omicron variant of COVID came out in South Africa. Yeah, and they yeah. were like, you're not going. It's a good reason not to go. Yeah, it, you know. <laughs> it was, yeah. So, Borders closing, you know. Yeah, but... Um, yeah, so yeah. we've been gone for a while now because, of the, one, it's because of summer. I think, mm-hmm. naturally, this will probably be a little bit of the pattern going forward as yeah. kind of things get busier. We'll take trips. We'll be on mission work. Um, kind of have that expectation that, hey, we'll do our best to get some episodes, but we got the opportunity to sit down, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of those experiences mm-hmm. that I got the opportunity to have um, in Cape Town. Uh, you want to just jump right into it? I mean, you might as well. Yeah. Let's, let's get on into time. it. time. I mean, obviously, you're going to take the lead more on that part because, yeah. you know, you've actually got mission experience. <laughs> I'm just here with my opinion. Yep. But I think helpful <laughs> it's informed, observation but... and informed feedback yeah, yeah, can yeah, help, yeah. definitely. So, yeah. So, um, we, along with about 20-something uh, young adults, uh, got the opportunity to go to Cape Town, South Africa. Um, on a mission related trip uh, back in June and practically for the most part because of how traveling is planning prepping all sort of stuff it pretty much was the whole month of June Mm -hmm. we were gone for officially 18 days um, and I think officially on the ground was about 15 or 16 Mm -hmm. um, specifically Um, and it was a great experience so this for most of the team that was traveling it was their very first time both uh, going on, on a mission trip um, <laughs> or summer. going on an airplane, mm-hmm. going anywhere international. Um, so it was really cool to be able to watch them have those new experiences and for some of them have some very not comfortable body reactions Man. as a result. How uh, long is the flight? Uh, okay, so the flight going to Cape Town, and we left from Fresno, which is an amazing thing. Thank God it costs a little bit more, but it it's actually it. is the same price. Yeah, when you take into transportation with yeah, that many yeah, people yeah. going to LAX or San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So uh, first flight, we went from Fresno to Arizona, um, which is, uh, I don't know, a little over an hour two, flight or yeah, two-hour flight, something like that. Yeah, um, I just made it to go to Boise. So There yeah, you go. Place Fresno to Phoenix. It's like, and then yeah. from Phoenix to, we went to Phoenix to uh, London, Heathrow. Heathrow. My Heathrow. wife always corrects me on these ones. It's a huge airport. I've yeah. uh, been there a bunch of times. Um, and that was about a 10-hour flight, I want to say, Jeez. on the way there, 11 hours. And then from London all the way down to Cape Town is about another 11-hour flight. And kind of basically the same sort of pattern on the way back. It actually takes a little bit longer, I think, because of how the wind and the way you have to travel. Uh, it takes like maybe an additional hour, hour mm-hmm. and a half longer. Um, so, yeah, so that it, it's it's just even getting there in the first place takes a really big, heavy toll on your body. So total, and that's what? Like uh, on the way there, it took us about thirty something hours. If you really wanted to say, correct. And, like and that. so, that's yes, insane. if you're wondering, no, I don't have like a gold car, <laughs> like lounge experience. Where I can go take a shower. No, we all smelled nasty, <laughs> funky. And so when I was sitting on that last flight, I was like, dang, I could smell myself Ooh. speaking to me. <laughs> and I was like, thank God no one's sitting next to me on the way bro. there. So, uh, yeah, it was a long trip, and it is a little bit of a toll on the body. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, once we got there in the ground, there's a lot of excitement with most people. Mm -hmm. Got a super uh, warm welcoming from our Cape Town family, our extended family there. 
Um, so basically, to kind of give some detail and context in that, we while we're on the ground, we partner with a lot of local organizations or in MPOs or NOPs. No, MPOs. Yeah, nonprofit organization. Mm-hmm. They call it MPO. It's a little bit just five hundred one c threes here. Right, like right. We would it's call just a different designation. Correct. Okay. Um, and uh, other local churches mm-hmm. and other even organizations that not necessarily even represented or not even um, or, uh, uh, what's affiliated. The, affiliated or not even recognized by the government according to legal statuses. Oh. But they do things because they feel led and called okay. by God. That's other amazing. ministries yeah, is probably yeah, the best way to put amazing. it. Um, so the leader uh, who was of our mission trip this year has been the person who has been heavily invested and also lived in Cape Town and currently is our lead pastor, uh, Pastor mm-hmm. Patient. Passion. And, uh, patient <laughs> and uh, patient has a lot of connections over the years from both living there and mm-hmm. the different relationships and family and friends that he has there. And so uh, the last so and so years, because we've gone, I went on a first my first mission trip to Cape Town specifically with my wife about five years ago. Dang, um, it's already it, been that long. Yeah, over five years yeah, ago. Yeah, we were still in the garage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dang. Yep. Um, and uh, that wasn't technically with the garage because the garage church didn't exist right, yet. Was this was the official with the garage church mission trip. First so that was one. really cool. That's even really too. cool. Yeah. Um, where before the, all the other tr- mission trips and kind of preparation times was more so with like cl- people who were already very close with one another mm. and knew each other and who are actually technically local pastors okay. here in town in Fresno and stuff like that. So there was already that bond. Whereas this one, it was like brand new people from a lot of different walks, mm. even though majority more young adults adults um, coming together um, intentionally having to be in very hard and difficult places with one another and do some very hard and difficult things both spiritually emotionally and sometimes even physically mm. um, and, and it built bonds with people I think if you ask some of these individuals like what was your experience they're going to talk about the things that happened there but also maybe some of the ways they encountered God but also now it's the, the, the family they would describe mm. they have both those who are currently now living in Cape Town and uh, those who are obviously part of the church here in Fresno. Um, so, yeah, so we, when we got there, uh, the first day was just more so of a rest. But after that, uh, the next day we went into our first place. And if I'm recalling right, we went into a township. By the way, if you don't know what a township is, um, imagine here in the U.S. we have the category of like a ghetto, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. We kind of use that word sort of loosely. Townships are technically places that exist because of the, and I would say, hey, pause this episode if you don't know the history of Cape Town, specifically South Africa, and you'll read a bunch of stuff about this thing called apartheid. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people pronounce it different ways. I'm going to pronounce it my American, California, English way, apartheid. Mm -hmm. Um, It was the whole country of South Africa. Correct. Uh, And uh, long story short, this is Cape Town sort of um, uh, situation of segregation is Mm -hmm. kind of similar thing, kind of... uh, closest thing i can kind of explain it to extreme Um, version but i would say even extreme uh version of that and specifically uh as you go the the deeper history you actually find out there is pockets throughout south africa that kind of uh didn't follow the same patterns like it was a little bit lighter and looser but Hmm. actually specifically cape town was the epicenter of this and that's why there is so many towns even though townships do exist outside of cape town Mm -hmm. but um, that's why there is so such a heavily uh population of, of or excuse me um uh so concentration. many different concentration that's the word yeah. looking for of towns. So would you say like well. a township is similar to like a tent city in <sighs> America? Dude, I, I I would say yes in certain because they're all different, mm-hmm. right? And um, let me let me lay out these uh, <laughs> different cultural expressions of how people describe themselves because you'll think that John is a racist after I say some of these things. Oh, Again, yeah, don't yeah. go Google it if you don't believe me or go yeah. talk to the I can give a very Cape Townians that we have that. in our lives yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. But long story short, uh, here in America, we have like three different main categories of individuals or ethnic groups we would describe. We'd say blacks, Mexicans, and whites. In Cape Town specifically, the three predominant ones are going to be white South Africans, which is a smaller population, but obviously just kind of of like uh, lots of power, actually had most of the wealth still do to a certain extent within uh, specifically Cape Town. Uh, and then you have this other group called Coloreds. Yes, you didn't mm-hmm. mi- hear me mispronounce it, Coloreds. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is actually some of the people we have at our church, like mm-hmm. uh, Sammy and Shireen, if you ever met those, for those who are listening and part mm-hmm. of the Garage Church. Well, um, Sammy's not colored, just Shireen's not colored. Ah, uh, see, that's that's a little He's complicated. Uh, oh, so in South Africa, he would be considered. It's complicated. Oh, okay. And it's it's just like here, you know how like, like for us, even you would say like white people who grew up like in Mexican um, – uh, neighborhoods or black neighborhoods it's almost like oh you one of us uh, kind of thing you, and you. even though you necessarily don't look like it or okay. you like literally like within your but biology like culturally culturally okay. you can be identified it even okay. people like 
super dark could still technically mm, be okay. colored. That's interesting. But then we have coloreds, which is a little bit more of like it, it, there's townships of that. And for them, there is more. It's not as yeah, so I say this. Um, it's not as impoverished as the black mm. townships. Okay. okay. Um, but it is still really bad. But what you see in colored neighborhoods, specifically or townships, is high what they would call gangsterism. By okay. the way, that's also what they call like gang uh, mm-hmm. sort of relation. They call it gangsterism. They say a lot of people are addicted to drugs and gangsterism. Mm. And so um, they would say specifically in colored neighborhoods, there's a lot of gangsterism. They do exist also in uh, black townships, but it's for whatever reason, very high in colored Color. townships. Interesting. And so, and then uh, again, they're kind of like the, I, I'm trying to use avoid using the word middle class because <laughs> again, these are extreme. Like yeah. it would be our poverty, poverty, right. poverty in the States is what the colored neighborhoods would look like. And then we have black townships where this is the kind of stuff if you did a Google search of like some of the worst places, quote unquote, in, in the continent of Africa, mm-hmm. this is where you have people literally smashed in together, dirt roads, people living in shacks. Mm-hmm. Um, I would even encourage you again, pause this episode, look up uh, Bequini, even something Bequini? like that. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in, t- in Cape Town, you can kind of see a little bit of what I'm talking about. And there's a lot of different ones. And uh, the, the townships we went to uh, specifically this most recent time were a little bit different than the ones mm. I went to the first time, um, but still some similarities in a lot of ways. Uh, the first time I went to Cape Town with my wife and a team, uh, we spent more time actually in black areas or black mm. townships. Uh, so Philippi is like one of the places oh, yeah. I preached. Um, and that's a, you can, you can Google that and you can see the reality of what life looks like for many people. Um, but this time around, we spent a little more time because of our connections, church relations, the organizations we were working with, um, in more so colored townships. But we did kind of had, we also were in black townships as well. But the first one we went into was Be- uh, Bequini. And um, it, I think for a lot of people, it was a very like, oh my gosh, this is mm. a, a reality of what people live. Because if you, again, Cape Town is a huge tourist hub. Yeah. And I encourage it's you. One of the most like, beautiful cities one of the most be- on earth. For me. And yeah. I've been a lot since that. Because again, the last time I went on the mission trip, uh, the first time with my wife five years ago, it was actually my first time leaving uh, the States. And uh, since <laughs> no, then, you've since been then, I've been a lot. Everywhere. Of, you've been to Italy, you've been to Greece, Turkey, Turkey Switzerland, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. A bunch of places. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so, I, and I still would say Cape Town is specifically yeah. one of the most beautiful places yeah. in the world. And a lot of people would also echo and believe that mm-hmm. thing. But however, you see this because of apartheid, the segregation Huge that divide. happened. By the way, that didn't end until 1994. 94. I want to say. Pretty sure it's Fact check me. I don't think it's either six or it's four. It's 93. Four. It's not six. It's either three or four. Okay. I think yeah. it, no, it's four then, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with all, and then when that's when they had Nelson, Nelson Mandela, Mandela rise yeah. to the power, or I said rise to power sounds bad. But no, I mean, like he has. His influence, his influence yeah. gained. Such I mean, he became game. the first black president. Because they had a president before that, I'm assuming. But yes. First yeah. black president in the country in 1994. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean, if you South, don't know the- South Africa was a British colony mm-hmm. originally. And then Dutch settlers came in. And I don't exactly remember if they fought a war with England or if England said, you guys can have it. And they fought a war with it themselves. There's a Dutch... Boer War. So, like, mm-hmm. the, the, the Dutch settlers became their own group called Boers. Yep. And they yep. speak. And they look like a friend named TJ. He yeah. looks like yeah. a, a they, they And speak, they make jokes uh, like they're Boers, like, like Cam, yeah. like Pastor Cam, looks like this. He looks like a – basically imagine like a rugby, like a white rugby player yeah. with lots of beef on him. This would kind of yeah. be the description. And they speak what's called Afrikaans, which is like uh-huh. a, this, a derivative of Dutch, yep. essentially. Um, and there's complex history yeah, within Afrikaans and all this yeah. sort of stuff mm-hmm. as well. Some of the, there's uh, I want to say eleven um, if, like identified like main languages. Uh, oh, no, no yeah. languages. Zulu, Osa, Osa, which I'm not going to try that. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, Afrikaans, Afrikaans, English, English. Um, There's all kinds. I, yeah. I can't even go down yeah, them all. Yeah, yeah. But but um, yeah. I think my point is uh, we went in there. It was kind of a cultural sort of like whoa moment for shock, a lot of people yeah. in shock. Um, and we got the opportunity to serve at a, uh, a school technically um, that is almost in a sense like acts as a ministry for a lot of ways um, mm-hmm. because of the kids that were going there. They are selected specifically. And what they're trying to do is they come from really bad neighborhoods and trying to make a change for that generation mm-hmm. and for that family, even though there's a lot of resources not offered to them. And it was just beautiful. Like, like we went in there and the first day got the opportunity to, to hang out with the kids, build relationships and everything like that. And we were actually weren't even supposed to come back the next day, but we had such contact. I mean, uh, mm. such a, like this like 
over the top sort of really connection with these kids that one of the things we even noticed too, like as we got there, like they're playing with like busted old equipment, like mm. balls and rugby balls and soccer balls and all this sort of stuff that just is nonsense. And we're like, you know what? Uh, we'll make sure when we come back tomorrow, we're going to buy all this sort of stuff. By the way, we're from where we're staying in Cape Town, like this township, about like an hour, hour and a half. Wow. Like, so it's a drive even then mm -hmm. that we didn't plan to do, but we just added in our schedule just because we felt led, led by God. Mm. But I remember the next day we came, and we had bought these soccer balls and rugby balls. And before we, like, we got out of the van and only half the team went because another team went to go prayer prayer for another activity mm -hmm. that we had to do uh, and be a part of, which was like a, a going and serving food opportunity mm -hmm. in one other, another township nearby. And uh, we, as soon as we got out of the van, I, I mean, just the kids went crazy. They saw these balls. And again, they're just, just for us, like most Americans were just like, these are just some Go to Dollar Tree, get you a ball. Dollar yeah. Tree balls kind of thing. Man. And they went ballistic. Kids screaming, so happy. Like kids coming up to you, thanking you, all this sort of stuff. Wow. And then for the next maybe three hours, we sat there and we played with them. Cam and TJ again, they got into it. They were playing rugby with the boys. The boys, were, and they were playing, man. <laughs> you never seen people actually play rugby. No, they are tackling yeah. each other. Kids playing soccer. Girls, uh, with Sambria, you know, her dancing, having That's just so a cool, super man. great time. And it just brought so much joy to my heart. And so we got the opportunity to do those kind of things, got the opportunity to go serve people. There's actually one day specifically, one of the last, actually, it was the very last um, like mission related uh, service opportunity that we did. We went to another township. I think it was just outside of Delft, um, hmm. and which is another really heavily impoverished area. And uh, while we were there, uh, we got the opportunity. I'm not exaggerating. You think I'm mm -hmm. going to make up these numbers? Um, it's and I'll help with this. I'll give you an approximation. It's 1,500 to 2,000 kids. I remember I was sitting there for literally an hour. I was part of the food line, like handing out kids, like wow. food to all these kids. And it was just like I was just going. I got to a point where I was just like, dude, when is this line actually in? But we got the opportunity to feed that many kids, and wow. it was a super blessing. And and I, I think this is something a lot of people. Um, it's hard to even put into language or words, if I'm being honest, like some of the things I saw with my own eyes. So there was even another township that we went to, and I'm actually, I'm going to choose not to name it on here, um, with another organization mm -hmm. that we we're close with. And it was the organization, it was a little like chaotic and it wasn't the, one of the best ones that we got the opportunity to serve, but we went into there, we kind of went into a really harsh part of the actual township, one of the rough areas, but I mean, just little babies walking around with no shoes no clothes like we're talking like kids our age jeff like around two years old with like no parents no one anywhere Dang. like shirts half torn and stuff like that clothes everywhere kids just filthy people like it's just another level that I can't go description of people mm -hmm. like living condition you're like how do people literally live here and we got the opportunity to uh uh be part of the process of serving them and giving food and everything else like that. But there came a moment where a little bit of chaos kind of erupted a little bit where we had gotten extra stuff for them. Cause we we're like, Hey, if we're coming here, we're not just going to give them cause like little things of soup. And if you're watching the video, it's like something super small and they're super grateful for, but then there came a moment uh, where the, we started, started to give out like suckers and some candies and stuff mm -hmm. that we also extra bought at the store. Um, and while we were doing that, the kids literally started fighting each other for it. And then they started like fighting, like, not fighting, but like really trying to like grasp. I mean, we were talking like at least 100, 200 kids just coming and trying to grab things from us. It got a little chaotic. But in that moment, I was just like, oh my God, what is going on? And there was another experience where we went to a refugee camp, which was specifically, which was uh, a Congolese refugee camp. Again, uh, oh. our lead person who led this trip, mm -hmm. uh, he's from the Congo. He was a refugee in Cape Town as well. So he had a very emotional connection with these individuals and the situation were there. And again, I don't, I'm trying to give dignity to people. So I'm going to leave out some of the details. So I apologize if it seems a little spotty here and there as I'm explaining these things. But th as we were in the refugee camp, a uh, situation uh, erupted. Uh, and these are individuals, some of them lived there for five to six years. And by the way, these are people who are probably educated more than most Americans. Mm -hmm. We're talking who speak numerous different languages, have graduate degrees, like have everything. Mm -hmm. But because they were fleeing for different reasons... Yeah. Uh, and found themselves in, in South Africa, in Cape Town specifically, and the government basically put them all mm. in this little thing. It almost looks like a circuit tent, like with this just little bit of a boundary on there. The government promised them all this aid and help. Even technically, um, the UN has given Cape Town and South Africa money for it, but they've never seen wow. any of that money. It's a whole other situation, um, as we found out and we had conversations with. And uh, But there came a moment where they like they are literally living on the generosity of people 
like the last time they had eaten because of the woman who actually we were there with and serving underneath mm-hmm. organization, uh, they hadn't eaten another like four, some of them were between four and seven days was last time. <laughs> we're talking anywhere from little babies, again, who are like, Lord. like can't even walk all yeah. the way to like people who were in their probably around 50s, 60s or so. Um, and, and, and it, and it, there came in a situation where there was such a desperation. They were trying and they were concerned that everyone wasn't going to have necessarily enough that people like the grown men started fighting. And while I was, I, while this happened, actually I was with a team inside this giant tent. And again, it's hard for me to explain it without really you being there and showing you, but we were praying for someone who just lost their mother that morning. And, uh, and I can just hear the eruption of like, like you've never seen, like you've been in a crowd and just like something is going mm-hmm. on and like this huge eruption and people are fighting and screaming and everything like that. And we come outside and basically we see the result and people quite literally, there's no other way to put it, but they're fighting over white bread guys. Hmm. Like, like a loaf, of like, like a, a loaf, like not even like a, like a slice mm-hmm. of bread, fighting over rice, fighting over just these little things that we as Americans would be like, I'm not even touching that. Or homeless people here would be picky enough to say, oh, actually, I don't want that. I don't need this and I don't yeah. want that. And it, and it did something within my heart that I was like, oh, my God, forgive me, Lord, for anything I have ever taken for granted mm. in my whole life. And so in a lot of ways for a lot of us, because of all these different situations, we also got the opportunity to, which is one of my favorite, and I think it's because what I do here in Fresno as well, back at home, uh, got to go into a, a, a prison and mm. minister to inmates, and most of them were the age of 18 to about 25, 26, uh, which would technically be identified as juveniles in mm. Cape Town. And we found out after the fact, all of them had been convicted. The unit they brought us to um, was, actually, I'm over sharing everything. Mm. I don't know how much we wanted to share of all this, but here, I'm going in there. Uh, they were basically, let me say, leave it at this. They were convicted of something very harsh uh, that most people would not want to be around. I'll let your mm-hmm. imagination put, fill in the best uh, with that. But we saw the Spirit of God just literally speak to hearts, grown men crying. And one of the things they told us, uh, the, the people who run, uh, the wardens basically, mm-hmm. um, and the correction officers were like, we usually have to beg people to come to service here. And I mean, we were in this room with uh, basically um, sort of bars on the walls. It was open air, so air would flow through. And it started off with one side filled up, maybe about 60, 70 people. And then by the end of the service, like there's people on the bars, like with their hands and just looking in. There are people are outside crying and sobbing. And we got the opportunity to pray for people. And I it just like, in that moment, I literally made sure, I, like I literally just took a second, I stepped back and mm-hmm. I was just like, the spirit of God is here. This is the presence of Jesus of mm-hmm. Nazareth is right here in this place. And so there was those experiences, got the opportunity to go even to his place, which is one of the most dangerous neighborhoods mm-hmm. um, in the whole world. Mm-hmm. And, um, Hanover Park. Yep, Hanover mm-hmm. Park. You can Google it and you can see how many, because of gangsterism and other things and, and murders, poverty yeah. and how many murders happen because of um, gang violence and all these different things. And um, while one of the evenings, and uh, again, I'm trying to be a little cautious because I don't think everyone knows about this. And I'm not trying to scare people because we were safe the whole time. Let me preface that. Mm -hmm. We had people making sure we were okay, we were safe. We're not just being naive, going to some stupid environments, not having precautions in place, not having resources Mm -hmm. or connections who were respected in the community who knew we were safe. So we were safe. But obviously you can't control everything. And this is the reality of some of the places we went to. So I was preaching at one of the services in Hanover Park one of the night. And um, while I was preaching, uh, someone got murdered outside uh, a little bit down the street. Um, and I guess there was some connection when someone who was connected with it came into the church screaming and crying. I didn't hear all this because we were worshiping and like there's a lot of things going on at the time, but asking for help and they were able to get the help and stuff like that. But this just kind of gives the context mm-hmm. of some of the places we're going. So again, I could continue on with story after yeah. story of story, how God met me, God met people. And I think the first thing is this, God definitely, I think for all of us, we were able to see a different side of reality that I think oftentimes we're all not necessarily aware of as much. It's very easy to Mm -hmm. think that our reality is the main world, is Mm -hmm. the reality in the world, not to realize how much we have to be thankful for, grateful for, or we can have as a perspective shift. And so you can describe that as now we gained empathy, sympathy, whatever the language Mm -hmm. you want to use with it. But I think that is um, one of the core things that happened for a lot of us. Because you hear me kind of, and we described it as a mission trip. I think for me, um, someone who has, and Jeff, we have we've have our sort of formal training Mm -hmm. in graduate school and seminary. I think I would like to describe kind of a mixture. We go... Not and this is what our lead pastor and the person who led the trip made sure it was clear. Someone from Africa. Why we have we have lots of Africans. Not I'm not mm-hmm. even like African American. I mean, look, Africans literally Africans. Africa. 
yeah. who are part of our church. Um, and Jesus is already there. <laughs> and I think we have talked about in this episode, like when we even talk about how the gospel first kind of started in the places it spilt over into first. And when we look at history, church history, and those sort of sort of things, and who were the church patrist- patristic fathers and all that sort of stuff, many of them were Northern African of descent. So the gospel is already there. So mm-hmm. we in no ways come in with the idea of, oh, I'm going to finally give these people, people the gospel, gospel these yeah. people who really need it. No, it's simply more so us being able to be exposed. So I think I like using the term of both of mission trip slash it's an exposure trip because in a lot mm-hmm. of ways what you end up realizing is the people who went there are the ones who are most greatly impacted by it and able to actually come back to yeah. be able to make hopefully better change in their own context and their environments as well. Um, I feel like you want to ask. Yeah, I mean, that was actually, I'm, I'm thinking we need to move to this question. I'm going to move it up here, but it's like, sure. who are missions for? Because I'm hearing you talk and a lot of the things you said was like how it impacted the team. Yeah. Now, obviously you guys had an impact on Correct. the people. There. Served people, yeah. ministered to people, cable came to faith. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, okay, you were bringing the gospel to some people who didn't know it. Yeah. Right. Um, but for the most part, it sounds like the trip had the biggest impact on the team. Correct. And so, yeah. And so this is what I would describe it as, because a lot of people in, uh, in part two, so hang on to part two, because we have mm-hmm. some of the questions that kind of naturally come up. I'll say, put those in your back of your mind, because we'll come back to them. A lot of people have a lot of critiques about when it comes to missions and short-term missions. Again, we'll talk about that here in part two in just a second. Um, but, I, I, and I, it usually is, oh, well, it just like, like now you're just the, the white people with the privilege <laughs> and you feel, and you feel guilt because yeah. of your life is And that's not what I'm trying to express here. There is the opportunity to have that sort of motif, uh, mm-hmm. or sort of that sort of now you would have this burden on you of all mm-hmm. oh, my privilege and all sort of stuff. Now I'm going to appreciate what I have. Yeah. And that's like, that's where it stops. Correct. It's like I went, I saw this horrible stuff. Oh my gosh, these poor people. Now I'm more appreciative of what I have. Yeah, and, and, and that's you just go about your life. And that is not what we've tried to do right. with the intentionality, at least for I can speak for our own uh, mission slash exposure mm-hmm. trip um, that we went on this most recent time. Um, yes, there's things I think that there's a healthy balance of Absolutely. saying, "Hey, I'm appreciative of what I have, and I'm thankful, and I go back to my context, and I'm grateful for what I do, and I'm intentional about how I use my resources, my finances, and how I view the world around me." Um, but it, it has to go beyond also just simply some sympathy uh, for someone or just mm-hmm. sort of this bad feeling or I have all this privilege kind of little mm-hmm. guilt trip about yourself um, I would say but before anything else and, and again there's kind of people have pushback and mm-hmm. I don't really care if you have pushback um, especially we'll if you've never been on too. missions I really don't care yeah. if you have pushback yeah. Dang, look, I've gotten bold in what mm-hmm. I was saying okay, I'm, that's that South African man I don't know yeah it rubbed off of me a little yeah. bit but, but I think it's this, absolutely. So if someone is wanting to invest, because a lot of us fundraise, majority, actually all of us, I would say, majority of us fundraised uh, mm-hmm. to be able to actually go, and it can be quite expensive. And even prior to my first mission trip, that was my big thing, like hang mm-hmm. up. I was like, man, this is a lot of money to be yeah. able to go do this. Like I could do use this money for here. And it's a valid reason, yeah. which we'll get to we'll in part two. Part two yeah. um, but at the same time, when people invest into that, you have to also realize you're investing into the person that you're actually sending. Mm. Like, like I know this is going to spiritually form you in such a way yeah. that you're going to become more like Jesus. That right. I know this experience is going to positively shape you. That it has the opportunity not just to affect your family lineage now, but also the community that you come back to. That's even yeah, as well. That's something I I was kind of leading towards, which will again we'll address that at the top of part two. Um, but just this idea of like, I think from listening to your story, the mission missions at least this particular mission was for both the people Correct. who were receiving you guys and for the people who went. Correct. Right. So it benefited. The team, I think they, just talking to some of them since you guys have been back, they have been changed very in a very so. positive yes. way. But then obviously the, the 2,000 kids you fed, even if it was just one meal, mm-hmm. I think that has an impact. The people you served at the prison, the places you guys preached, you guys helped paint a church, mm-hmm. um, just getting to play with kids and let them be kids in a world where it's very hard to be a kid in. Yeah. I think that has an impact. And in just, again, a place that already has Jesus, already has Christianity, Correct. already has the gospel. But to be able to experience 
God through you guys being there and like showing them love and bringing the resources of America yeah. essentially there yeah. to be used to benefit them that can help deepen their faith and go, wow, God really does care about us because he sent this team of people from Amen. the garage church to like help us, even Amen. if it's a short, you know, Amen. You, you want to yeah. know something? I didn't, and I and I push back on this because I, as we talked about too many times on this episode, mm-hmm. which I've tried to avoid, uh, or not this episode, uh, on this podcast about how we're we kind of come from. Me and Jeff now have been influenced by the Anabaptist sort of mm-hmm. tradition, so uh, <laughs> we're not necessarily all of our guests. I'm cautious to say, yeah, I'm cautious to say we're not patriotic because I mm. am in certain ways. Um, but I'm not maybe in your defi- standard definition yeah. either at the same time. Yeah, so sometimes yeah. I'm a little bit, I like to stay adjacent to when it comes to, tr- to, to conversations mm-hmm. like that. Um, maybe we'll do episode on politics coming up we'll here wait till soon. November. I know. We'll I'm, 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 we'll see. I mean, we already that. know the result of the election already. It's, we're not prophets. We're just reading. It's <laughs> obvious. Yeah. Another um, conversation. Yeah, but, but, but anyway. But I, I, I think <laughs> this time around, it also kind of hit me. Well, there's two different things. Can I share two different yeah, things? Yeah, well, first thing on it's the same kind of thought process, and then one will be kind of offshoot of that. Mm-hmm. The first one is this. I, I, I know and I hear all the time, like, America is often looked to for kind of guidance and as like a leader to the world. Mm-hmm. And I've always pushed back at that, that, and I still do in certain ways of like, ah, yeah, okay, like, like about. we're not God's chosen anointed to Absolutely save not. and seek the world. No, Jesus mm-hmm. is the one who seeks and saves yeah. the lost. God not can America. use any empire or nation to do Correct. what he wants to do. Correct. Absolutely. And so, but God showed me something. And mm-hmm. I looked at, because I listened to the to, to different music that's being listened to, which is, is obviously specifically U.S. and it's mm-hmm. in English and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And like even the understanding is of what church is, life should be when it comes to even human sexuality and where mm. Cape Town currently is, oh, with yeah, sexual yeah. ethics and mm-hmm. what is legalized, what's not, all this sort of stuff. They really do look to the states and to the Western mm-hmm. world for guidance in that way, whether Culturally, positive for sure. or negative yeah. reasons, right? And so I sat here and I think, okay, there is something I have to recognize that I have, like I have influence even when I don't recognize it. it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so where our hearts are, as well as the American church mm. oftentimes can also heavily influence others who are looking to us even as that well. Could be a whole episode so if itself. we're not healthy, yeah. and I even mean starting both individually with us, mm-hmm. with locally with our churches, with our communities, and then bigger C church, mm-hmm. this United States and what we're projecting, yeah. then we can quickly see how it also has negative influences on the world, right? Wow. And, and the thing is this, I, I think a really simple way you can kind of see this even show up for people as well is like people who are who immigrated specifically from other countries and other places, especially where there's war torn or mm-hmm. some kind of crisis happening. There is a great appreciation for the states. Mm-hmm. And I used to kind of get like, I don't I was like a little frustrated. I didn't yeah, understand yeah, yeah. it, but I sat with it long enough mm-hmm. and I'm like, you know, what? no, no, this this makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. And also see now also through adjacently why there is such an influence of the states on other places mm-hmm. even as well. Okay. So again, for whether positive or negative, we have to realize our influence is actually global. John, that's really and, powerful. And yeah. we have to be careful with it. Because also, I'm going to be honest, there's some of the church settings I was I was in there last time, five years ago, and mm-hmm. even this time, and other places I've been in the world, not just Cape Town, mm-hmm. where I say, oh, that is the ugly side of America that mm. was that was that was manipulated to look good and it was transported ah. and now you guys think are doing it because it's cool because Americans ah. did it when in reality that's actually nothing connected with the gospel I'll be mm. completely honest mm. and we're only ones to blame first off right. we can't just point fingers and say right, they should have right, known right, better right, right, right. or that well, I mean we we yeah, well, we have the Holy Spirit in us who gives us wisdom sure. and discernment don't get me wrong but we also res- realize that. And also we can see how healthy things also show up mm. in other places in yeah. the world too. Um, but in, in part two, you also see me how I'll, I'll we'll talk about even just for a second, uh, a study who wrote, uh, came out with, I don't want to say it was Barna, it was someone else. I was Pew, reading maybe. it. Uh, Pew maybe mm. actually came out and it was talking about actually where Christianity is growing the most. And it's not in the States no. and it's not in any Western the countries. Global South. And it's in the global South. Mm-hmm. And actually you see revival taking place within the continent of Africa and specific mm. places even as well. Yeah. Um, but that was the first one. And then the other thing is this. I went in, because again, this is I've been out of the country a lot of times, and I came when I was later on this trip to kind of help others kind of experience God in a lot of ways. And I wasn't necessarily like with the expectation that I was going to receive okay. very much, right? Okay. And maybe that's good or bad. I'm just being transparent yeah, yeah. with where I was. Like I was content. You're kind of like, like been there, done that. Like yeah, but it wasn't like about me. It was correct. I was right. like, I want this to be about other people. Right. 
And then the crazy part is within the first couple of days, God showed up and he made himself really known. And he was speaking to me so loud that like I couldn't ignore it. Mm. And I was humbled to the place where like, imagine this. We often think it's the pastors who influence the the congregants or mm -hmm. the lay mm -hmm. people, right? Mm -hmm. Or just the normal quote unquote people. Right. And um, I think there's truth in that to a certain extent because that's why we're leaders. Obviously, yeah. But I will tell you this, there were some men and women of God that I spent a good amount of time with when we were on the ground who have no titles, who are not known by anyone, who will never see themselves behind an actual mic of any sense, will mm. never find themselves behind a pulpit. And when I say that the Spirit of God spoke so loudly through them to mm. me, I mean, I can't ignore it. Wow. And the love that they have for God and the authenticity and the genuine uh, genuineness mm -hmm. about the faith. And it reminded me of what is actually important, why we actually are Christians. And wow. I know we, we love this podcast, and we will still continue to do it. Talk mm -hmm. about big ideas, and let's wrestle together, because I think that's what the place that we want right. to cultivate in this space with one another. Right. But I also was reminded by God of, like, when did we depart away from the simple, basic love mm -hmm. of just simply connecting with different people, having conversation, sharing a meal, prayer the powerfulness of prayer i mean mm. it, it it just it convicted me of how we just in the american church want to get through things so fast let's let's yep. get it done let's yep. move yep. on yep. give me your money and let's go let's go yeah. let's go let's go let's go let's go and that's a little harsh i apologize but, but yeah. it feels some that way our culture's forming us and mm. pressuring mm. us to be like this and to act like this and to worship like this mm. when in reality i think as much as i talked about how america has an impact on the global uh, community and the mm. global church, I think we need to shut up and listen to actually what everywhere else and what the Spirit of God is doing Dude, in other yeah. places. Yeah. Because I think we would realize there's places where we need to repent, mm -hmm. where I realized from this trip I needed to ask for forgiveness and, mm -hmm. to and to actually practice repentance of and to be reminded of the powerfulness of the simple gospel the good news about jesus christ he has come to seek and save the lost mm. jesus of nazareth not someone born into a high place or statue but simply someone who was like us mm. and came and dwelled among us and gave his life to be able to stop the cycle of violence continuing wow. on and on again and being able to offer us this thing called eternal life and and it's just this beautiful thing how we get to be able to connect with it and tell others about it on a daily basis and so Again, I could go on and mm -hmm. on and on about my experience and what God spoke to me and what he's doing. But I would say is um, it was a powerful trip. Um, and now uh, we've made the commitment for the next five years yeah. as a church to continue to invest into South Africa. Uh, South yeah. Africa. Um, and we'll go into that here in part two. I realize yeah. we said, we said, we're, we look, you're like, guys, just go into part two yeah. already. Well, we're going to end it here it. and then please come back for part two. Um, cause we're going to get into a lot more. Yep. We'll see you guys in the next part later.